Now, power crept is a term for when a more powerful version of a card is released, meaning there's no reason to play the original card anymore. But in this list, we'll be going over cards which have been power crept, but still continue to see play nonetheless. And at number 10, we have Jinzo, who has basically seen competitive play ever since it first came out in 2002. Jinzo has the effect that while it's on the field, trap cards and their effects cannot be activated, and it negates the effects of all traps. It's a 2400 attack monster that requires one tribute, which gave it a pretty competitive attack power value in the early days of the game, while also basically shutting down one third of all available cards. And locking down trap cards on a one tribute summon has just been situationally useful over the years, even after Summon Skull Beatdown was no longer a meta strategy. But then in 2014, Denko Seka came out, which is a level 4 monster that has the effect where it cannot be special summoned, and also while you control no set spell or trap cards, Neither player can set spell or trap cards or activate any spell or trap cards that are already set on the field. And since almost all trap cards need to be set before they're able to be played, Denko Seka is basically a level 4 version of Jinzo, and is much easier to play since you don't need to tribute summon for it. And it still allows you to play spells or continue to use the effects of face-up traps, as its only conditions for its effects are to not have any set cards. But face-up cards are fine. And ever since Denko Seka came out, there wasn't really a reason to play Jinzo, as it's just a better version, if all you want to do is lock down your opponent's trap cards. Of course, you could also just use Royal Decree, which is a trap card that negates other trap cards, just like Jinzo. However, despite the fact that Denko Seka came out in 2014, that surprisingly did not stop Jinzo from seeing play. In fact, in 2017, it saw a huge resurgence in play for some reason, and appeared in about 100 different meta decks during that year that topped events. And that was three years after Denko Sega came out. It was in such a wide variety of decks too that I'm not 100% sure why Jinzo saw such a resurgence in 2017, but it kept seeing play even up to this day, and its last appearance being in a Domain Monarch deck in 2020. Mainly because Domain Monarchs require a Tribute Summon monster to be on the field in order to be able to activate their field spell card, which locks your opponent out of so many monsters from the extra deck, which is not something that's possible if you use Denko Seka instead. Although since 2017, Jinzo has sharply dropped off in competitive play, and I can only imagine that's because Red Reboot came out in 2018. Although despite having so many better versions of itself out there, Jinzo just keeps seeing play nonetheless. And at number 9, we have Mirror Force. This is a trap card that can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack, which then allows you to destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters. This card came out in 2002 and was a beast of a trap card back in the day, and was even banned for a couple of years. And Mirror Force was so iconic that they just released straight up better versions of it starting in 2015, as Stormy Mirror Force and Blazing Mirror Force came out in that year, with Drowning Mirror Force coming out in 2016. All of them have basically the same activation requirements as Mirror Force, where you can only activate them when your opponent declares an attack, and they also get rid of all of your opponent's monsters in a different way. Stormy Mirror Force allows you to bounce all of your opponent's attack position monsters, which is just a better form of removal than destroying them. Blazing Mirror Force allows you to destroy all the cards, just like Mirror Force, and then inflict a whole bunch of effect damage to your opponent and yourself. Drowning Mirror Force allows you to spin all the cards back to the deck but can only be activated when your opponent declares a direct attack instead of just any old attack. So these three cards are a lot better. Even Quaking Mirror Force was better for a hot second before Link Monsters came out. So with so many better versions of Mirror Force, it's kind of surprising that the original one still sees play. They did release a new support card called Mirror Force Launcher that only works with the original Mirror Force and allows you to search it out easier. But that card is not the reason Mirror Force still sees play. In fact, Mirror Force Launcher doesn't see competitive play at all. Funny enough, the reason the original Mirror Force still sees play is because sometimes you just want to destroy your opponent's cards without taking any burn damage. Usually, Stormy Mirror Force is the go-to Mirror Force of choice. But also, the same kind of decks that even play Mirror Force also really love to play cards like Solemn Judgment and Solemn Strike, which require you to pay a whole bunch of life points in order to use their negates. So it's kind of risky to play those good counter trap cards alongside Blazing Mirror Force. And if all they wanted to do was destroy cards and not bounce them, then the original Mirror Force is kind of the best bet. Now, it doesn't see a whole bunch of competitive play. That's why it's at the bottom of this list right next to Jinzo. But it does still see competitive play, even though there's a whole bunch of other better versions of it out there. 
And at number 8, we have Barrier Statue of the Torrent. This is a pretty low statted monster with only a thousand attack and defense, and simply has the effect that neither player can special summon monsters except water monsters while this card is on the field. This card came out in 2006 alongside a Barrier Statue of all the other attributes. And of all the Barrier Statues, Barrier Statue of the Stormwinds has seen the most amount of competitive play over the years, but Barrier Statue of the Torrent has seen the most meta competitive play recently. And the Barrier Statues were powercraft by a card known as Fossil Dina Pachycephalo, which came out two years later in 2008. Has a slightly higher stats than all the Barrier Statues, has the effect that if it's flipped face up, you can destroy all special summon monsters on the field, and also, while it's on the field, neither player can special summon any monsters. Usually, if someone wanted to play a card that locks out all special summons and doesn't require a tribute, Fossil Dina Pachycephalo is the go-to choice, as it's the best card that does that. Although occasionally, there are situations in which you'd want to use one of the lesser powered versions, like Jaojin the Spiritualist, or one of the other barrier statues, which are the only other level 4 lore monsters that prevent special summons and can also be special summoned themselves. And the reason Barrier Statue of the Torrent still sees play is because, for one, it combos pretty well with Paleozoic Frog decks, since they do nothing but special summon water monsters anyway, so they can play this floodgate pretty easily, and also, surprisingly, because it has a nice combo in Dinosaur decks. There's a card called Gizmek Uka, the Festive Fox of Fucinity, which is a hand trap that has the effect where it can special summon itself from your hand if your opponent special summons a monster from their main deck. And also has the effect that when this card is summoned, you can target one monster your opponent controls in order to special summon one monster from your deck, who both shares the attribute of that monster your opponent controls, and it has an attack that equals its own defense. Now usually, this is used in order to search out a copy of Animadorn Arcosaur, who has zero attack and defense and allows you to search out more dinosaurs. But if you use this card during your opponent's turn when they activate the effect of Crystron Halky Fibrax, then you can target Crystron Halky Fibrax in order to special summon a water monster from your deck. And what do you know? Barrier Statue of the Torrent has an attack that equals its defense. So, with this combo, you can bring out Barrier Statue of the Torrent right at the start of your opponent's combo chain, in order to lock them out of special summoning other monsters except water. And most decks that use Crystron Halky Fibrax in order to go into combos don't use any other water monsters besides Halky Fibrax. So, it's a very ingenious way to bring out a Floodgate during your opponent's turn once their combos start. And once you start your turn, you can simply get rid of Barrier Statue of the Torrent with an Airy the Water Charmer Gentle, and then continue your plays like normal. And at number 7, we have Mystical Space Typhoon. This is a quick play spell card which simply has the effect to destroy one spell or trap card on the field, and was released back in 2002. Mystical Space Typhoon is probably one of the most played cards in the history of the game, because it immediately started seeing play once it was released and never stopped seeing play since 2002. Because the ability to destroy a spell or trap card on a quick play spell card is just super valuable, especially since it was the only card that didn't have a cost to do that back in the day. In fact, the card was limited for most of its life on the ban list, and they even released a weaker versions of the card because it was so strong. That way, players had some more options to it. Eventually, the power creep of the game got to the point where it wasn't that big of a deal anymore, so they went in the opposite direction and started releasing more powerful versions of Mystical Space Typhoon. In 2016, we got two of the strongest versions of them, Cosmic Cyclone and Twin Twisters. Both of them sharing the distinction of being a quick play spell card, allowing you to either pay a thousand life points to banish a card instead of destroying it, or Twin Twisters, which allows you to discard a card in order to destroy two spell or trap cards instead of one. Both of these effects are just straight up better versions than Mystical Space Typhoon, and have all the same advantages of being a quick play spell card. And the final nail in the coffin was in 2020 when they released Lightning Storm. However, despite the fact that more powerful versions of this card have been added, Mystical Space Typhoon still sees competitive play, but usually as a side deck option, and also played alongside Cosmic Cyclone and Twin Twisters. Generally, MST is not played by itself. If it sees competitive play, it's because the deck that's using it wants more spell or trap card removal than just Cosmic Cyclone or Twin Twisters. So unlike Barrier Statue of the Torrents, it's not played in place of the card that power crept it, but usually played alongside them. And at number 6, we have Torrential Tribute. This is a trap card that can only be activated when a monster is summoned, and then has the effect to destroy all monsters on the field. Just like Mirror Force, this card was heavily played ever since it first came out, as this one card came out in 2003 and was limited on the ban list for most of its life. Although eventually, the game got to a point where it wasn't that big of a deal anymore, so it was unlimited, set to 3 copies, 
and then just kind of never stop seeing play. Now, Torrential Tribute doesn't really have one card that directly improves upon it like the previous four spots, but they did release a board wipe trap card in the game that's so powerful that there's no reason to play Torrential Tribute if you just want to get rid of all the cards on the field. There's a trap card called Evenly Match, which you can only play at the end of the battle phase in order to force your opponent to banish cards from their side of the field face down, so that they control the same number of cards as you do. And if you control no cards, you can activate this card from your hand, which basically forces your opponent to banish all but one card they control. And with how much less play trap cards have seen over the years, if someone was playing any trap card at all, it would probably be something like Evenly Matched and not Torrential Tribute. So it's not a direct power creep. It's more of a showcase that there's better board wipe trap cards in the game now, as Evenly Matched works on spells and traps in addition to monsters. However, Torrential Tribute received new support in 2020, called Fury of the Chiron Shin, which allows you to search out Torrential Tribute from your deck, and then has a graveyard effect that allows you to protect water monsters from destruction effects. And funny enough, this card is not why Torrential Tribute continues to see play. In fact, most decks that still play Torrential Tribute don't play the searcher at all. It generally just sees play in trap-heavy decks, like Paleozoic Frogs, which can actually make use of the searcher, but also decks like Eldlich and Altergeist, who don't play any water monsters, but do use a lot of trap cards. Being able to destroy all monsters in your opponent's turn is pretty valuable, and generally, being able to wipe out all monsters in the field has historically been pretty strong, and decks that play a whole bunch of trap cards can't really play evenly matched to its full potential, even if they'll sometimes play it alongside Torrential Tribute anyway, because evenly matched is still just a really good card to play if you're going second, even if you do have a bunch of other trap cards in your deck. And at number 5, we have Lava Golem. This card has the effect where it can only be special summoned from your hand to your opponent's side of the field by tributing two other monsters. Then, locks you out of being able to normal summon for the turn, and inflicts 1000 points of burn damage to your opponent during each of their standby phases. And Lava Golem's an excellent card for getting rid of normally indestructible monsters, as very few cards have protection from being tributed. Lava Golem was released in 2003 and saw pretty niche play over the years. But then in 2015, the entire Kaiju archetype was released, and also the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode. The Kaijus are an archetype of monsters that allow you to tribute one of your opponent's monsters in order to special summon them from your hand to your opponent's side of the field. And one of the great distinctions about Kaijus is they don't lock you out of your normal summon when you use it. So they provide an excellent form of removal without a huge trade-off, other than the fact that you're giving your opponent a high attack monster. And the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode basically has the same conditions as Lava Golem, where you need to give up your normal summon in order to use it, but it allows you to tribute three monsters instead of two. So it's just straight up better version of Lava Golem for the effect of getting rid of cards. So with the entire Kaiju archetype in Winged Dragon and Raw Sphere mode, there was not really a reason to use Lava Golem anymore since it's kind of a worse version of both of those things. Except it keeps seeing play anyway, which is kind of the theme for this list. And the reason Lava Golem keeps seeing play is a threefold reason. For one, it sees play a lot in Infernoid decks as a side deck option, as that deck is all about having cards in the main deck who can't be normal summoned or set. And they don't really normal summon anyway, so they're perfectly fine playing Lava Golem as it's able to fit well inside that deck. And outside of Infernoid decks, it usually sees play alongside the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode, as a side deck option when they just really want to draw a card that can tribute their opponent's monsters. And lastly, it's played instead of Sphere Mode in cases when they think their opponent is playing around a Sphere Mode and only ending on two monsters instead of three, which doesn't matter if you're able to throw a Lava Golem down. Although even in those situations, they usually played alongside Sphere Mode. Generally, Lava Golem is just played when they really want to have more Sphere Modes, but can't run more since you can only have three copies per deck. Lava Golem is just the next best thing, and generally only played in decks that don't really use their normal summon very much like Infernoids or Pendulum decks. And at number 4, we have Skullmeister. This is a hand trap that was released in 2010, and has the effect where, if your opponent activates a card in their graveyard, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard to negate that effect. This card was power crept by another hand trap known as Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, which came out in 2018. Ghost Bell has the effect that if your opponent activates a card or effect which would move a card in the graveyard to their hand deck or extra deck, or special summon a monster from the graveyard, or banish a card from the graveyard, then you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to negate that activation. So it just covers more bases in Skullmeister, and if you want to stop effects that involve the graveyard, 
Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion covers just about everything. However, Ghost Bell is a hard once per turn, whereas Skullmeister is not, and that's why Skullmeister sees play. It is technically an inferior version, but you can only use one Ghost Bell. But all copies of Skullmeister in your hand are live, and if you really want to shut down your opponent's graveyard, then Skullmeister is just better to have multiple copies in your hand, and usually played alongside DD Crow, who has the same distinction. Technically a weaker version than Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, but is not once per turn. It also has a distinction where it's a dark attribute, and has a higher baseline attack, so it has the option to be normal summoned in an emergency. But really, the most important part is the fact that it's not a once per turn, and is also generally played alongside Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion anyway, as well as DD Crow. A lot of the power crap cards basically see play because they just want to use more copies of that card's effect. And at number 3 we have Polymerization. This is a card that came out in 2002 and was basically required in order to go into fusion monsters. And since it was required, it was pretty basic in how it was used, where you can only use monsters on your field or in your hand. Fusion monsters were not very popular in the early days of the game. Or if they were used, they weren't brought out with polymerization generally. If you only use two materials with polymerization, that's a minus two in card advantage. So you need to bring out something really good with the cards in order to justify all the resources you're losing. That's why polymerization has been power crept like crazy, where if an archetype has fusion monsters, generally they'll just print an archetype specific polymerization so that you don't have to use this card. And they also just printed more powerful versions of polymerization, in the form of super polymerization in 2008, which allows you to use your opponent's monsters as well as your own, and a spell speed 4, so it's one of the most powerful removal cards in the game at the moment. Then there's also fusion substitute, which came out in 2014, and literally treats its name as polymerization while it's in the deck. So any card that works on poly also works on fusion substitute, and basically only allows you to use materials on your side of the field for a fusion summon, but has a nice graveyard effect that allows you to return a fusion monster from your graveyard back to the extra deck in order to draw one card. And then in 2017 they released Ultra Polymerization, which also only allows you to use monsters on your side of the field, but has a graveyard effect that allows you to special summon the fusion materials from the graveyard. And even with these better polymerizations and the plethora of archetype specific polys with cards like Thunder Dragon Fusion, which allows you to use banished cards as a fusion material, and has a graveyard effect that allows you to go plus one, or even Neos Fusion, which allows you to fusion some with cards from the deck and protects monsters from the graveyard, the original bad polymerization still sees competitive play, but mainly in hero decks and some variants of Lunalite decks. Hero decks have a monster called Vision Hero Vion, who has the effect where it can send a hero monster from your deck to the graveyard when it's summoned, and then has the effect where it can banish a hero monster from your graveyard to add polymerization from your deck to your hand. And since both of those effects are good, and this card is very easy to bring out in hero decks, usually hero decks will play polymerization just because Vision Hero Vion gives them an easy way to search it out. And they have a way to recycle it with extra hero Wonder Driver, and hero decks occasionally see competitive play, and including recently, so polymerization is just a staple card in hero decks because of Vision Hero Vion. So it still sees competitive play because of that, even though hero decks themselves have better fusion spell cards, like Miracle Fusion or Dark Calling. And at number 2 we have Effect Veiler. This is a hand trap which was released in 2010 and has the effect where you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard during your opponent's main phase in order to negate the effects of one monster your opponent controls until the end of the turn. This effect is incredibly useful against all kinds of decks, so Effect Veiler has seen competitive play ever since it came out. But in 2018, a new card was released called Infinite Impermanence, which is a trap card that can be activated from your hand if you control no cards, and also allows you to negate the effects of one of your opponent's monsters until the end of the turn. But also, Infinite Impermanence, if set as a trap card, gains an additional effect, where it negates the effects of all spell and trap cards in the same column as this card until the end of the turn. So it can be used as an effect veiler during your opponent's first turn, and even after it's no longer live from your hand, it has an even better on-field effect that can allow it to negate a monster effect and spell or trap cards, assuming you're able to place it in the correct column. And since Infinite Impermanence is just a better effect veiler, especially since it can't be negated by monsters that negate monster effects, it's just kind of eclipsed effect veiler in usefulness. There's no reason to play effect veiler anymore if you can just use Infinite Impermanence instead. Now. The reason Effect Veiler still sees competitive play is because it's played alongside Infinite Impermanence, usually in trap heavy decks or Zodiacs. If the person who's playing those decks just really wants hand traps to negate monster effects, 
and three copies of Infinite Impermanence aren't enough. They'll also throw in copies of Effect Veiler. Plus, Effect Veiler has a nice distinction where it's also a level 1 tuner monster, which is sometimes useful, but really, the reason Effect Veiler still sees play is just because it's used alongside Infinite Impermanence. Infinite Impermanence is just one of the most played cards in the game, period, and playing Effect Veiler just gives them more chances to draw a card in their hand than has Effect Negation. So it doesn't see anywhere near as much play as Infinite Impermanence, but still sees a lot more play than all the other cards on this list so far. And at number one, we have Pot of Duality. This card was released in 2010, and basically only allows you to go hand neutral, where it allows you to excavate the top three cards of your deck and then add one of them to your hand. The other cards are then shuffled back into your deck, and also, you cannot special summon the turn you activate this effect. It also has a hard once per turn, so you can't use multiple copies in the same turn. But a hand neutral effect that allows you to choose one of three cards is very good. So, even though it has a restriction where you can't special summon the turn you use the effect, that didn't really stop the card from seeing a whole bunch of competitive play over the years. Now, this card has been power crept a little bit by two other cards known as Pot of Desires and Pot of Extravagance. Two cards which allow you to draw two cards instead of one, while also having pretty big downsides as well. And being able to go plus one with downsides is better than going plus zero with even harsher downsides. So generally, there's no reason to use Pot of Duality when two better cards exist. And Pot of Desires and Pot of Extravagance see a heavy amount of competitive play, in the same tiers as Infinite Impermanence of just seeing play in almost all decks. Now, the reason Pot of Duality keeps seeing play despite the fact that it's been power crept is because some decks don't special summon a lot during their turn, and the effect of duality is still good. So decks like Subterror, Altergeist, and Grand Maju, who play a lot of trap cards and special summon mainly during their opponent's turn, are perfectly fine with playing Pot of Duality for the excellent effect to choose one to three at the top of their deck, and generally don't mind not being able to special summon during their turn. But also, Pot of Duality is just played alongside Pot of Desires and Pot of Extravagance. Usually, not both of them at the same time, but there are some decks that have all three of these pot cards in them. Usually in decks that can't play both of them, but still want that draw power and don't really special summon during their turn. And Pot of Duality just sees more play than all the other cards on this list, only really beating Effect Veiler and topping spots by a small margin. Where really, Effect Veiler and Pot of Duality are the two powerhouses of cards in this list, who still see competitive play, despite being power crept so hard. Except one distinction Pot of Duality has over Effect Veiler is that it's been power crept twice and still sees play. Whereas Effect Veiler has only been power crept a single time. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other power crept cards that still see play that I might have missed? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as it was pretty hard to find any spots for this video. And of course, ideas for future videos just like this one. And also, if you're one of the 60% of people who are watching this video and are not subscribed to the channel, if you're watching this far into the video, YouTube would probably recommend all my other videos too anyway, so it's all good.